Jayden Broad, WNYC uh, host, co-host, uh, creator of, of Radio Lab, one of yeah. my favorite um, Thank you. radio shows uh, that's kind of grown and expanded into the behemoth that it is. Uh, thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. It's great to be here. Yeah, so my name is Jad Abumrad. I uh, am, uh, I think I, I think of myself as a musician. Okay. Um, that's sort of how I stumbled into the world uh, from as long as I can remember. But it, 20 years ago, I made a show. Uh, it, was, it was then just a radio show called Radio Lab, hence the name. And it became, uh, like caught a wind and became one of the first big podcasts as part of this new vanguard of podcasting. And so right now it is a show that uh, is on 600 radio stations. Wow. It it uh, is downloaded 130 million times a year or something, something wow. like that. So uh, you've invented way, a whole I've... new form of rock star. Wow. <laughs> it's a div, it's a very, if rock, it's like a nerd, nerd rock, nerd rock star hey, or something. That's what, um, that's what this is about. You know, I think, yeah, well, I think a know. lot of us, we're, we're just trying to find ways to, to make it. And yeah, we try to, to find ways make to make it with a holistic feeling of accomplishment and, and feeling like we're doing something that really we believe in. Um, yeah, totally. I think that's a good way to put it. It's like putting out stuff that you feel like actually has a fighting chance of adding value to the world rather than like sucking the marrow of all that is good, you know, which yes. so much media does. Um, but yeah, so Radio Lab is a, is a, uh, it's sort of like a, it's like these big deep dive long form documentaries about, uh, complicated things, whether that's science things, it could be like, uh, it could be law things. I have a whole spinoff project about the law. Uh, I've done a series, a couple of series about music. Uh, I did a big nine part series about Dolly Parton, that's but right. again, it was like looking at Dolly Parton as a universe through which to see America. Uh, so I've done a lot of these projects that I hope kind of give people a new way of looking at the world. The thing that runs through all of them for me uh, is just like a deep, like music as a language that you use to express stuff, mm -hmm. like that you use to see stuff. Um, I, you know, we were talking in, about my musical upbringing. I still think of myself first and foremost as a musician and not a journalist, right? Yeah. But, Which is important because uh, you're, you're, you're speaking with a, a class full of aspiring musicians, you know, people are just trying to make sense of it all. Like, how, how do yeah. I, how do I make a life out of this? How do I make a living um, channeling totally. my love of music, whether it be playing an instrument or singing, uh, you know, in a choir totally. or going off and totally. doing something completely left field, which I think Radio Lab is an example. Yeah. Of that. So this is fantastic yeah, that we get to pick your brain. Uh, totally. About all this. Yeah, it's funny because like, I feel like I am an example of somebody who I, I, I tried to be a musician and we could talk about that and it yeah. didn't work. Yeah. Like I wanted to be Matthew Deere, right? I wanted to be a guy who writes music and is known for that. But uh, mm -hmm. I tried that, not really in the way you're doing it, but uh, more as film stuff. Okay. And I just, it didn't work. I just like, I couldn't make it work. But what I ended up doing in falling through the side door into what I do now is I realized like music for me is a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's like a, it's a, it's a series of metaphors that I use to see stuff. Like I use, like I understand the world by thinking about harmony or counterpoint or, you know, it's like if you can think about, I, I, I was just the other day walking down the street and thinking about granular synthesis, which is one of my favorite new like fangled things I, that I'm messing with here. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is the coolest metaphor for life. You know, like there's just all of the things that we do in music are ways of understanding other things beyond music. And so I actually, that for me is how I've made music work in my life not really vocationally, even though I do write the music for a radio lab, but I have other people who do that now, but it's more like, I just, I just use it to think, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And granular synthesis, the small definition, what, what would you call granular synthesis for those that maybe oh, it's aren't so thing. deep into it? So basically it's like a, it's like a, the playhead of anything moves left to right. Okay. Right. So like if you hit play on an audio file, it starts in the left and just moves at the time we're living in to the right. Mm -hmm. um, granular synthesis is a, a really interesting way of screwing with time, right? Mm -hmm. So it it basically, the, imagine the playhead moving left to right, and then at a certain point it just stops and it starts to stutter mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and the playhead is skipping around. 
Mm. And it's grabbing little tiny particles of the sound and 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 playing them like like um like a cloud, right? Totally. And so then so it, and then you can set how much it's jumping, you can set how dense it is, how uh is is it moving backwards? Is it, you know, and 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 I I love that i mean it's first of all it sounds amazing you can create you can take any sound and make these beautiful long gorgeous drones right mm -hmm. it's like a drone machine yeah. you know it's amazing uh but what i love about it is that it's like life right like you move you you, you have years where you're just like doo -doo 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 -doo, and then you have whole decades where you're just like doo -doo 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 -doo, mm -hmm. where you get stuck and you're just like you're trying to move but you're like you're skipping around you know what i mean mm -hmm. and and so and, and and sometimes the the uh the density of your life is little and sometimes it's like intense uh and so i don't know like granular synthesis for me is like it's like that game when you're when you're in second grade and, and you're running around really fast and then everyone yells freeze <laughs> and you stop where you are yeah uh totally. and you sometimes you get stuck you know like in, in a kind of developmental way you get stuck in that way for like 10 years yeah. it's like ah you know so i don't know so i think about like i think I, that i find musical elements really inspiring mm -hmm. for thinking about life in bigger ways also i think moments in life that may seem very small and insignificant if you highlight them and and loop them or blow them up like like a sound from a grand distance and it just turns mm -hmm. into something far more epic which i think radio lab basically does you know you're, you're taking yeah. you're taking small moments of humanity and, and and just putting the magnifying glass on them and finding yeah. ways to to expand them and explode them into a a shareable experience um yeah so yeah, yeah very um, much like granular synthesis for what i for, um, yeah from what yeah, i understand absolutely. uh but yeah i think for me too I, i've always liked you know we've well, i'm sure we'll rehash a lot of things that we've talked about personally um off off camera but yeah. what i've always liked about making music um and have always been drawn to is is sample and and mm. and sound of reality morphed and and transformed into something either melodic that wasn't melodic or uh, pitched down. Um, I think the human voice always dropped an octave or raised an octave, just does something yeah. internally that, that kind of triggers this weird dream state reality yeah. that we've kind of talked about before. Yeah. Um, and granular synthesis is, is so apt for doing that. Um, and I think that's a bit of what the show kind of, what I love about the show is you, you, you feel like you're floating through this kind of meta meta reality um that's taking cues from things you're familiar with and okay i know yeah i know conversation and i know i know um you know uh, allusions to um you know facts and data points but but when you mix in the sound element that you you're, you've gotten so good at which will break down I, I would love to hear your process about how that all started mm -hmm. um and when you start adding these other triggers that that the brain is kind of used to hearing in other environments but yeah. then when you mix it into the, the, the podcast method or the, or the radio show method, you, you begin telling a story on a completely different platform um, and you start reaching people in different ways. Yeah, yeah. Now, do you think, was a lot of that premeditated or did you just kind of figure this out as you went or like, how did, how did the format of radio lab, I guess, basically, how did your love of music and your love of, of, of storytelling and, and seeing the world through metaphor, how did that enter the editing phase and, and the storytelling phase? Oh, that's such a great question. God, it's a big question. Just... Sorry if it's too loaded. No, no, it's great. <laughs> yeah. It's great. I love the way you just uh, expressed that because it's exactly, you put into language oh, that's something I've always felt oh, okay. like that there is a, it's funny, there's a, I was just listening to this guy, uh, Anil, Anil Seth, okay. who uh, studies consciousness and, uh, you know, consciousness is a, is, is a, topic we might discuss on radio lab mm -hmm. in fact i think i've had him on uh but i was uh I was listening to one of his uh, interviews and uh he was describing the 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 way that the brain hallucinates mm -hmm. you know like every reality like what i would call reality what you would call reality is itself a kind of hallucination ah, right yeah. like your your what you see you know and and, and this can be proven very simply by uh there's all kinds of like illusions you can do to like make the brain think that its arm is over here and mm -hmm. these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And what you realize is that the brain is creating perception as much as it is receiving perception. Mm -hmm. And reality is something that like we, it's like the overlap point of all of our 
hallucinations in subsets. Wow. We call that reality. Wow. And there is something um, that feels deeply true to me about Radio Lab more in its old incarnations than its recent ones. We've gotten much more investigative and much more sort of topical. But it, it began as a show that somehow understood that below the level of reality are these kind of just subterranean, the scaffolding underneath reality is not what we think, right? And the sound seemed to always sort of point you at that. Like uh, you are, I'm telling you a story that is true, that is based on facts, that is deeply reported, where you hear scientists saying things, but then suddenly the sound is telling you, yeah, but there's something else going on here. Totally. There's something deeply mysterious and spooky happening. Yeah. And I never could figure out a way to, I mean, it's a, it always was something that just felt intuitively right mm -hmm. to me. And, you know, it's funny, it, it, the, the sound of the show, it originated, uh, well, it was there from the beginning, but I do remember a specific night where something kind of clicked for me. Um, you know, because I, I went to music school and I was studying like, weird avant-garde compositional stuff you know like music concrete and weird stuff like that that it's very very fascinating but doesn't really have much application in modern life totally but like music concrete is where they would take like a car horn and then they would sample it and they would make that into a musical note and that kind of stuff and wow, they would just this is radio it. yeah it was totally radio so when i wandered into journalism i just had all that sound in my head and i was it just felt very natural to me and at that point, there like the podcast universe was there was none, and so like there were no models. There was like news. There was Ira Glass, brilliant, but like there wasn't a whole lot in between. So like I didn't have, and I'm I'm very glad for this now, but I didn't have a lot of like templates. Yeah. Um. And I do remember this one night I was making this show called Radio Lab, except mm -hmm. it was an earlier incarnation of it. And at that point, sorry, this is a very long story. No, this is great. Okay. Um, this is what we want point, to hear. We want to hear all the details of how you get somewhere. Okay, cool. Well, yeah. at that point, Radio Lab was, it was like, a, it was just me playing other people's stories. Okay. You know, and I would, I, it was sort of anthologizing other cool documentaries that I thought were interesting. Um, someone had gave me this gig to do at WNYC and mm -hmm. I was just doing it. I hadn't yet really developed like, oh, it's a show about ideas and science. That was all in the future. Yeah. But I had this problem, which was that I was playing everybody else's stories. And one story would be like, to think of it in terms of musical genres, it's like putting Fugazi with like Detroit techno, yeah. you know, and you're just like, ah, eh, they don't really go together. And then you go to like an R&B song. It's like, it was each story was its own genre and together they didn't really mix. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was trying to connect all these things uh -huh. in my show and, and and at one point I was like, you know what? I think I need a theme song. I think I need a theme song like that. I just need a, like a theme song, but I hate theme songs. I hate like even the great theme songs, like the Game of Thrones theme song. Yeah. You're just like, I don't got to sit through four minutes of this. <laughs> Skip. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I was like, I want a theme song, but I don't want to have to sit through it. So I want like a 15 second theme song, right? Like a sting. Yeah. So I remember one day. Uh, I got a bunch of people together and I was like, just say the name of the show. This is Radio Lab. You are listening to Radio Lab. And I had like 20 people record this and I took all of these weird sounds and I just started, like, I spent a whole night. I remember I was there like till the sun rose making these little 15 second stings that I could play. And I was just doing it really fast. Um, and I was doing it in that music school, music concrete sort of way. And it just felt natural to me. I remember listening to it the next day and being like, Oh, shit, these are interesting. You know, like you take, you take, I was taking voices and stretching them, uh, you know, and like doing like really rudimentary, like time stretches mm -hmm. and reversing and doing all the things. And it got to that feeling you were describing, which is just like, huh, these are real human voices, but something is not right mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 you slip into that dream yeah. space, which became for me the radio lab feeling of like, you, it's a little bit like you're 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 on a little raft on the surface of a big water a big lake and then suddenly you just fall in and you just kind of go into the depths totally um and uh and that became the feeling and it, it, I, I i captured it in these like 15 second bits and that became like a pointing arrow for me to be like oh well that's that's my sound right mm -hmm. 
it's it's real, it's true, but it's also dreamy and surrealistic and a bit off. Mm -hmm. But it's it's seductive, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. It's not off putting. It's like it's it's like pied pipering you into some new reality that is actually just adjacent to the one you're in. So it was like all of those things got captured in the sound, and then I just kept kept going with it. How much do you think finding that method and and those sound bites? in turn affected the way the show would kind of form you know once you found that that felt really good to you do you think that it influenced the way that you went out and started the journalism aspect of it like yeah when i yeah. talk to people i want to I'm, I'm also in that mindset you know you always knew that you had this kind of subsonic vibe happening do you think it yeah. affected the way that you talked to people and, and built interviews later yeah i mean it yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, uh, on a number of levels, you yeah. know, just in terms of the 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 underlying mood, the ethos of the, the mood, yeah. of the work. Um, I knew I wanted to drive people to that feeling. Cool. But I knew that in order to do that, you don't you don't just get there. You have to kind of walk step by step mm -hmm. through a process in order to get to that feeling of like it used to be the radio lab thing used to be you're talking to a, a person usually a scientist yeah. and they are telling you this experiment and then you kind of go march through it and you get through the methodology and then they did this and then they did this <laughs> and then they got to this cool epiphany where like huh that i didn't expect that and then the music comes in mm -hmm. and it's this like dreamy beautiful music and then it's usually there that the scientist or the host says something in a kind of poignant, hushed voice. And you feel as a listener that like feeling of awe, right? Like yeah. that feeling of wonder. I'm, t I'm taking that, that right be... now from, I can't, I'm not recalling specific moments, but when you're describing that, I'm like, oh, I've been there like so many times, whether I was in a van on tour or just totally. in my headphones on a plane, like, ah, yes, there's that moment. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like that moment. And I can tell you, I have a whole library of music that uh, that we've made and that we've used to to give you that feeling. Yeah. Like that used to be the radio lab feeling, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, and then you know, and, and it was a, I used to see my job as getting people there, mm -hmm. right? But but more than the actual, there's a whole different way, a whole different level of it for me, which is, and this relates to the process, the creative process, mm -hmm. right? For me, like when I made those fifteen second things. That, that helped me understand the language of the show I was making. Mm -hmm. I didn't really know what I was doing. Totally. You know, I just had a, mm, I want it to be weirder. Or I want, you know, it's just like a, I couldn't even put it into language. Mm -hmm. And then you go through a process and then it's only in retrospect that you realize you've made something you like, you know, mm -hmm. you know, there are those creators who I, I'm sure like they have a grand vision and they walk into a room and they just create it. I'm not one of those people. Like I, I will like, toil 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 and then i'll look back and be like oh that one thing i did last mm -hmm. tuesday was pretty interesting mm -hmm. oh i think i got i captured something there let me do more of that it for me that's how it's always worked yeah. right it's it's always been like an inductive process you know it's like you you start small and then you kind of it's almost like you tunnel your way up to the surface and then you look around and be like oh shit, i'm in a new place yeah, yeah um and so that spirit is infused through the show and, in, and through everything I do, like I never approach anything, whether it's the making of something or an interview with this idea that I know what I'm doing. Cool. You know, you've got one question and you ask that question and, and hopefully it leads to two or three other questions and then 10. And then suddenly you're in a new space, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that idea of like a small mind moving through a vast world, uh, that is I, that's the sound that's the method that's the spirit of everything i do right uh and so the sound i think points at that right it's like totally. that it's like you are so tiny <laughs> you know and you're just looking around being like whoa oh my god what's over there you know yeah. there that that is in, in the sound too and and like that's not every project like you hear a lot of music that like makes you feel it feels very inevitable mm -hmm. like that's not me I, I want the music to make me feel very lost and very small and floating on an ocean because that's actually how i feel day to day yeah you know what i love about what i'm hearing is there's almost 
and I'm hearing a lot of similar things that, that mm. happen with me, the way I, I, I create and make music. And I agree there are completely opposite brained people in the arts and, and creative world that can just completely take something and say, I'm going to make this and it's mm. going to be this. And I have my spreadsheets and it's going to look like that. And it does. Yeah. And it's amazing. Um, but what I'm, what I'm hearing is there's probably a split somewhere in your, in your, your personality where you're able to create that world, that universe. Once you've done a lot of the, the, the brain uh, foundation the, or the, the laying out of, okay, I'm, I'm going to schedule this interview. I'm going to find the scientist. I'm going to, yeah. so you are, you, there is a part of you that is very functional and, and yeah. set up the show to be very, um, uh, you know, amorphous when it needed to be, but who's the jab that, got you there or how did you you know how hard was it to kind of orchestrate the thing you know first or to to to, to set up the structure that got you this 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 awesome dream world stuff yeah yeah sort of as i hear you're asking like there's a wandering through there's a wandering person yeah and then there is a planner. There is a there is a person who has to think about architecture and structure yes. and how to. Yeah. Do you, do you so, find that is that difficult sometimes to to navigate in between the two, or or did you have somebody else that maybe helped you kind of with a bit more of the structure stuff? Or I'm just wondering as a as an artist yeah. or as a young person coming into this, you know, yeah. what I, I know I would always have struggling areas where it's like, okay, I would love to do a radio show, but where do I start? You know, how do I who do I talk to? Who do I you know, how do I make this thing a reality? Um, yeah, yeah. Are there some tips I mean, or things that you've kind of experienced yourself in the beginning? That's a really good question. I uh, I know things have changed. Fabrics have changed. You know, things have changed no, big no, times since question. you started, but I'm just curious. It's a great question. I'm having this feeling of like, oh, it's a great question. And I have a great answer in <laughs> somewhere, but I'm trying to find it. <laughs> Don't force I it. mean, I, I will say this, like I, I, uh, the thing you're describing of like you, you do have to split yourself in two in yes. some way like you do have to have like there is a part of you that is that is like this this free spirit and you have to somehow create spaces for the that person to just have like unstructured free time but then there's another part of you that has to be like ruthlessly planning on behalf of that other person yes. right you know what i mean and I have not been good at that for most of my career. Um, as evidenced by like just how many deadlines I've missed. <laughs> like I, unfortunately, in my little world or like in WNYC and in my team, like I am renowned for missing deadlines. Like I miss them all the time. You know, I don't anymore because I've, I've gotten better. But okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, like the, and and, you know, we came in, not making a lot of shows like we came in doing five at a time and now did you miss those deadlines because you were focused on expanding the show more like i most, was just mostly. like being a perf yeah being a perfectionist yes and, and so know. it wasn't like you were just off you know swimming in a pool and you just didn't want to turn it in you were working on the idea that was yeah. radio that i mean yeah i was working on the idea but i was doing it i was like i was tweaking and nitpicking it to a degree that wasn't ultimately useful but, but that's I, what we I, heard I, right yeah yeah for we, sure we, like, we I mean, were the given early, the, the nitpicky results um but then i you know it's uh i i just i recently ran into uh one of the people that, that i started the show with ellen horn and she she is very good at that at that ruthless planning thing mm -hmm. and she was at the very beginning, she was able to create whole structures for like how this show could live in the world. Gotcha. You know, we can we can take five and we can package it and we can give it to program directors and they can strip it for a week. And and she figured all that out. Had she not been standing next to me at the beginning, I probably wouldn't be here. Gotcha. Right. Um, so there's a lot of like I was very lucky to like I as a creative mind, I began very malformed in mm -hmm. a way like. And I was lucky to meet people who could complete, help me complete the thoughts. But these days I'm much more now in the, in the planning. And, you know, so I spent a lot more time thinking about like how to plan things and how to, how to architect deadlines and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I've gotten much, much better at that. Um, but I do, I do have a deep 
appreciation for like if you're going to be if you're going to particularly these days uh Matt like mm-hmm. when like I look around at all the arts and I'm like how does a person make it in the arts like all the signposts have been torn down mm-hmm. you know what I mean uh I mean I don't know do you, can you make a living based on Spotify streams I'm Sp- guessing not Spotify you no. know no. yeah but like you probably have to like create a whole mosaic of things that, that includes DJing, live performances, album sales, spot, you know, you have probably have a whole pie that you've got to think about. And, and, and you have to make that for yourself. Like there's no predefined path. Absolutely. Anymore. Yeah. And so what that, what that necessitates from a creative person, and this can feel daunting, but I actually feel like it's also exciting, yeah. you know, is you have to create, you have to be super clever. You know, you have to have like, 10 different side hustles and you have to figure out how to have those side hustles and not die. And then God forbid you want to have a family like you or I, like then you've got, it's a whole other sort of juggling. Match. So um, you do have to be extremely creative, but also extremely clever at mm-hmm. how you manage that creativity. And that, that has for me been a late learning, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but I do, I do a lot of like, I'm obsessive about my calendar now, okay. you know, like, like, okay, this is my like, this is my do nothing but brainstorm space. And this is my like fucking emails, right? Emails yeah. are, are the death of creativity, right? Yeah. So I'm like, okay, this is where I'd write emails, but everywhere else, no emails. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'd be super, super hyper um, organized. So I protect that like free space. Ah, you know? That's really good advice. Um, I feel like, you know, yeah. And it's like, there's so much. There's so, yeah, there's so many ways to piss away your time now. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it seems like you said the road, the road maps and, and the road signs are all gone. Um, but at the same time, you've been given, you know, a thousand new ways to, to navigate. Yeah. Um, so yeah. it's, it's a tricky yet inspiring, you know, creative world to be in. Um, yeah. But absolutely, you know, I, I tell my students during my, my, my lecture, um, you have to basically wear 10 hats now. Yeah. Um, whereas in the past you could, you could have just been an artist that maybe got taken up by a label or a management group. And, and was basically, you know, um, shown all the things that needs to happen and we'll take care of it for you. But in yeah. this day and age, you know, when I hear new artists or I see new artists, it's almost expected that they have to have their whole, they almost have totally. to come with a, a look and a following and a, and a team and, and you know an art uh, a collective and they, they kind of they and they want to and that's that's the beauty of it i think we forget yeah. because we're kind of a little bit rooted in the past that we might yeah, see it old. as work but a lot of the newer younger generation could see it as well that's just what we do you know yeah <laughs> that's that's yeah. that's what we have to do and that's how we do it um, um but you know but it's interesting it, it like yeah being an old man i think <laughs> this is this is like you're, you're absolutely right there's a generational thing here but like, uh, I do think it actually like when you see these people who are doing it well. Like, I'm I'm a I I'm a I like Andrew Wong on YouTube, right? Like, yeah. just this wonderful, creative, inspiring musician, and he's got the online course, and he's got the YouTube feed, yeah. and he's got the Patreon this, and he's just like he's he's like I don't know how he does it. That's insane. But what I get from him every time I watch is that like he really enjoys making music Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. so in a sense like it puts a real premium on like you've got to protect the artist right Mm because it's like if you actually because there are going to be like years where no one pays attention to your Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. and like what sustains you through that period well i just like making music you know what i mean like as long as you actually enjoy it and you feel like you have something to share to people and it wakes you up and if someone doesn't listen to it it's not going to make you stop then I feel like you're good. Then yes. all the other stuff can get kind of created around it. Yes. You um, might need another job during that time. You might need another yeah. job. You can't Look, just do that or else early days of early days of radio lab. I, I would, I got a job in this new thing called the internet. And, uh, and that was, I've heard of it. Again. I think it, it, stuck, it stuck around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, but there were, there were these things called websites that people wanted suddenly. And I, I didn't know about it, but I was like, well, I'm, I'm kind of young. I can help you with that. And that's how I made ends meet. You know, it was horrible. It was horrible work. Uh, but uh, I'm sure the websites were great, but 
Yeah, the process for okay. But you know, it was for like Condé Nast and Hearst New Media and gotcha. things like that. But whatever you got to do, you know, yeah. then I would come home and I would, you know, make my music and I would be so happy to do it. Yeah. I delivered pizzas for quite a while. Uh, there you go. I studied anthropology at U- University of Michigan and um, knew music was the way to go. I didn't know how I'd get there, um, but just knew, you know, and I, I, I stuck there with it. Go. And I understood that it was more important that I enjoyed doing it at the time, you know, as opposed to. Yeah how many people totally. listen to it. But I, I've told my students as well, you know, what, what, what really, who determines if you've made it, you know, aside from yourself. Mm. Um, mm. And I, I remember thinking when I burned my first CDR, you know, off my computer of a song that I made, and it was a full four minutes that, that I programmed and I, I sequenced from left to right. And mm. I made a song and I played it in my car and I listened to it in my car on a CD. I thought I've made it, you know, I've made a printed mm. piece of music that that even if nobody else hears it you know i feel like i've succeeded as a recording artist um yeah well and, i can imagine you okay so i'm just gonna put myself in your yeah, position yeah. my my you, i'm gonna imagine myself in your life for a second okay. you, it must feel good to to dj your own t- song for a room full of dancing people and to see them not stop dancing but maybe even dance more that must be like an amazing moment it feels good for me personally to DJ songs that they haven't heard yet mm. that I've made yeah. that have that reaction. Um, I've that always had a, a bit of a once it's out there and once it's been publicly released, it kind of doesn't mean as much to me. I think I'm, yeah. I'm in, a, in, a, in a to a fault. I'm, I'm more focused on what's coming. Um, so I, I'd always be obsessed with, you know, the song I've got in the oven, you know, that I'm that I'm working on. Um in a broader sense, um, I've just always enjoyed the process. I think more than the 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 out the physical printed output. Um, yeah, um, yeah. And I think that's why it was so fun to play a song in a car for the first time. You know, because I just knew I could go right back and do another. Yeah. One. Oh gosh, I can only imagine. <laughs> um, let's talk a bit about your team. You know, you mentioned uh, what twenty people now that kind of uh, were, is that we said twenty uh, were on the radio live team. Yeah, I think it's 20, I don't know the exact number at this point, but 23, 20, something. I think it would be good for the for the students here to, to hear a bit more about like kind of logistical stuff that goes into yeah. to putting a show together um, and just maybe about your roles now, you know, as opposed to what we've talked about as you started, you know, how things changed and what are your focuses yeah. now and what are just some of like the day-to-day, like the emails, the the cross checking, the things that have to happen to put a show together sure. of this sure. this magnitude. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's a big team now, and it's the show has changed a lot, mm-hmm. and my role in relationship to it has changed a ton. Yeah. Um, but you know, and and uh, I'm actually really, I think, the last two years, I've I've sort of taken a few steps back and and to allow all of these incredible people to sort of to give them more space mm-hmm. because. The problem that I'm facing now is that like a lot of these people are actually smarter than me, they're better reporters than me. Some of the young producers have started writing their own music and some of the music is wow. like, damn, that's amazing. Oh, that's like, great. Actually, that's better than I would make. So um, initially that was very humbling, but I was like, no, no, this is this is cool. Like I, sh- I need to just like allow this. And so I, I see my job as like holding the space in yeah, a way, like yeah. just like hold, hold, holding the, the, the boundary or something. But yeah, so we have, uh, I'm going to say a number, it's probably wrong, eight or nine or ten producers. Mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. and a producer in the context of of this work is a kind of a hybrid of a reporter, interviewer, um, booker, uh, audio editor, sometimes composer, uh, sometimes mixer, like they do all the different wow. things and they do them in different proportions. You know, some people are much better at the audio editing. Some people are much better at the reporting and finding a story. Um, is that but, unusual uh, in, in the radio world to do all those things at once? Um, I think it's, I think it's, uh, I mean, the thing about audio is that it's, it's a bunch like, it's, it's pretty, it's a, it's cheap in a way, like, you know, to get an interview, put it in the computer, make it like one person could do that. Mm-hmm. So you do have people, not just in my shop, but across the industry who are like one-stop shops. Mm-hmm. You have these roles and typically they get uh, 
you know, th those are the rules you see through the industry. But then you do also have like a producer. It's one of those catch all terms. They can be any number of those things, mm -hmm. you know, and all of my folks tend to be generalists. You know, they will, uh, they'll, you know, on Monday, they'll be hitting the phones, calling, trying to find a new story, uh, talking to different experts, trying to get access to a source, doing basic reporting journalism stuff. On Tuesday, they might be taking six hours of interviews on the computer and trying to cut the best bits down to like 20 minutes. Okay. Um, on Wednesday, they might be shaping a storyboard for a story that's about to come out in a month. Uh, and on Thursday, they might be writing the music for a, for a story that they're working on, right? So there's many different modes that they can be in throughout the course of a week. Mm -hmm. But how it works for us is, you know, we meet every Friday and we pitch stories. Uh, you know, is what about the story about this? What about a story about that? And there's 20 of us around the table and we're just all throwing in ideas. Some of those stories get greenlit or like yellow lit, as I like to think of it, okay. because it's like, maybe, maybe that could work. And then you go into this very long, arduous reporting process of making calls. The ideas always change as you're like trying to figure them out. Because again, like these are true stories. We don't know the endings of a lot of them. Mm -hmm. So you're following a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, somewhere along the way, maybe you've done eight, nine, ten interviews on a particular idea. You, you, you just have that feeling of like, oh, I think I got something. And at that point, what we do is we, everybody listens to the selects of the audio. Okay. And then we get together and then make a storyboard. And that's just like a, a map, you know, like what if we start, you know, here and then this, then, then there's this middle part where like we do the history mm -hmm. and, that, and mm -hmm. then we do like an explainer and then we go back to the character and the character does this thing and then something happens. You know, like we try and map it out. Then we organize the tape in the flow of that storyboard and to see if the tape likes that position often the tape doesn't ah okay because you're like oh well, the tape actually would rather be in a different order so then we redo the storyboard do that a few times and then we and then when you feel like the tape is in in a good place according to the storyboard structure then you start the editing process and you start this like just shaping it and that's one like you do the cool editing tricks and you put in the music and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but we spend a lot of time in this reporting, planning, organizing, storyboarding phase because the stories have gotten so big that if you've got 20 interviews for a story, it's just too much. It's a lot. Like you have to organize it and like really know what you're doing before you get lost in tape. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the, those are sort of the beats of it. Gotcha. And uh, we're working on 40 or 50 stories a, a, at once. Yeah. You know, like each producer has got three or four they've in their pocket and they're making calls, you know, and you just hope that on any given week, one is ready. You know, yeah. that's kind of the odds of it. You're just always playing, playing the odds. Do you do a lot of um, like final interviews? Will you go back and get a little extra or kind of get, follow up on a, on a point or an angle if there's a, if there's a gap in the oh, storyboard? Tons. Yeah. Tons. Yeah. Tons. I mean, that's what will happen is when you do the story where you realize, oh, my God, I don't even have this whole section gotcha, that I need. Gotcha. 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 And we'll interview people sometimes two, three, four times, yeah. you know, because the first interview is always really exciting and electric. But you, you don't even know enough to ask the right questions at that point. Totally. And it's for me, at least, it's only when I listen back to the interview, I'm like, oh, man, Jad, you didn't follow up with that. You should have asked that. What, what's wrong with you? And so then you call them back and you say, okay, I have more questions. And sure. then, you know, you'll, you'll re-interview that person. You'll interview the person that they work with. You'll interview the person that disagrees with them. You just kind of like try and get a kaleidoscopic view. Um, so it's never one voice. It's like, it's always a team of, of interviews. I'm going to go a little left field on you. Um, do you think you have a stronger grasp of the human experience? after having done this for so long? Or do you think you have less, you're less aware because you've just seen so much um, that you've mm. realized there's just, there's endless ways that the human experience can go. I have a stronger grasp. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if I have a strong grasp <laughs> in general, but. Uh, How has it affected you as a, as a person, you know, being this close to, to people's stories for so long? Yeah. It's a, it's, 
it's changed me, man. It's like, it, it's a, I'm a, I am a, I'm a deeply introverted dude, you know, as are most of us my own... in the music world. Yeah. Is that true? I think so. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's there's uh, Mick I, Jagger. <laughs> there's the rest of there's us. David Bowie. And then I think the rest of us are just introverts. <laughs> um, uh, well, okay. I'm part of that, that larger tribe of just like, you know, solitary, like, uh, happy to be alone. Right. Yes, yes. Um, but then I always have this moment where I just get, I just, I get so tired of my own perspective. I get so tired of my own brain, Yes, you know, just like not even in any kind of noble way. It's just like, Oh God, I'm thinking those same thoughts again. Yeah, yeah. Just like, you know, and, and then I need other people. I need, I need to hear those stories and those stories become a way for me to just snap me back to the world. Oh, right? that's great. And, uh, and every story begins with this, feeling of like like a brain fever in some way like you know when you hear something or you are you are you 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 read something and you're just like oh my god i did not i had no fucking idea about that Mm -hmm. i didn't realize the world worked that way yes you know it's like when you find a new artist too that you you hadn't heard of you're just like holy shit there's this whole new wing on the musical house of my brain like it's just what uh and and you just go into this crazy like feverish state of excitement every story begins that way gotcha. you know and then because it's like it takes your little perspective and just yanks it open you know and it's almost like a prerequisite so there is some way in which um the work is a kind of sh- it, it, it's tethered to personal growth in a really deep way um because it's like, and so in that sense, I feel much more aware of how many other minds and how many other worlds and how many other experiences exist in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and in that sense, also, you feel so much smaller, you yeah. know? Um, it's more, a good more hallucinations thing. of reality. Yeah, yeah, it's just like, you know, there's so many ways to slice it. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't know if you go back to Texas a lot, but I go back to Nashville all the time. Yeah, yeah. And it's like, Every time I step off foot off the plane, I'm like, oh, yeah, right. This is a whole mm-hmm. universe, you know, yeah. and uh, it's very easy in, in, the, in the New York of it all to just think, oh, yeah, this is this is the reality. This is like teeny. And so like the word I, I feel like that sense of smallness is really important. Um, uh, that, yeah, but you can't feel small unless it's relation to something big. Mm-hmm. Uh yeah, I don't know. I'm just talking now. I suddenly oh, lost good. the plot. Well, let's let's stay in Nashville for a little bit. You know, we're yeah, we're yeah, all yeah. we're all started for young Jed. Um, when did you start playing piano, or when did you start showing interest in music, like as a performance? I, or, I, yeah, yeah. I started really young, and it, I was forced to. Okay, you know, I uh, I was. I think. I mean, the more I look at it, like to think back on it, the more it, I I feel like it was just like an after school program, basically. Yeah. It was like just uh, lessons with a teacher kind of thing, lessons with a teacher. And uh, so um, both my parents were scientists. One is, again, a scientist at Vanderbilt, but they Vanderbilt is this big kind of giant ecosystem in the middle of Nashville. Mm -hmm. And you walk across the street from my school and you get to their labs and then you walk across the street from their labs and you get to this place called Blair School of Music. Ah, okay. And and that was where I would spend uh, my afternoons, you know. So my parents would work late, and they couldn't take me home, and so they'd say, go practice. And wow. so they would send me to the practice rooms, and I'd be stuck in the practice room. And it was the most tedious, horribly boring place. But I would just sit there and do scales, or, like, I would – they had timpanies, I remember, yep, like, yep. in one of the practice rooms, and I would go and, like, hit the timpanies or something. And, like, I just – that was my world. I just – and I hated it at that time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but I would, you know, I, piano was the thing I did. It was, and, and I'm really glad for it now because it's like, you know, that idea of like discipline and rigor and just like slowing your brain down to like learn to play. I feel like that served me really well, you know. Um, you're doing scales for a lot of it. You know, you're just like, you know, you're just, you're just uh, shedding in some way, yeah. you know. But there's so much work that goes into it that that is not, exciting how do your parents um, also how do your parents feel about radio Lab? they 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 liked it because it was initially science focused yeah you know and then as it wandered my mom is always like 
why don't you do more science? You know, so she, she became part of that chorus of people it's like, where's the science? <laughs> um, but they, they love it. Cause it's, I mean, it's like, I mean, they've both been on the show a bunch of times, Oh, cool! you know? So it's like, it's this, I mean, it makes what they, to, you know, it's like flattering to know that like what you, I mean, my mother has spent her whole life working on one protein, one protein for 40 years, yeah. which is a lonely journey. And then suddenly like the, the, to suddenly have her kid be like, Hey, what's, so tell me more about CD 36. You know, it's like, it's, it's flattering. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and I don't know that a lot of scientists get that, that interest. Um, yeah. So they like it. They like it. Cool. I'm sure there's been a lot of like interest from the, from the world of science and, you know, to, to appear on a show like Radio Lab when you know it's being downloaded so many times or that it's being heard on, on, a, on a crossing layman's uh, lines, you know, and it's, it's kind of bringing, bringing up a, a more uh, understandable vocabulary to something like a protein that somebody has been yeah. so focused on. I'm sure it's very flattering and it's kind of an honor as, as a scientist to be on that show. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so too. And I, if if I hope that what we do when we when we do science reporting, which yeah. is still a lot, a lot, a lot of the time, is you well, you capture the sort of emotional life of a science of science. You know, it's like it's like it's super duper hard work, but it's always these people who are like driven and passionate. Mm-hmm. They got like they're just like, how does this thing work? And they're just they just they must know, you know. And that's a uh, th- that's a very intoxicating thing to be around, you know. Do you still yeah, do? Hope... Do you still produce shows? Like yeah. yourself? Are you out there recording? Are you still interviewing? Oh yeah, I mean here and there. Yeah. You know, uh, for the last few years, I, I, uh, I haven't made a lot. But then when when COVID happened, um, the show really had to change on a dime and become much more responsive to to what was happening. And and I ended up diving headfirst and, and doing a a ton of like quick dispatches. Okay. Um, and then uh, since then, I've done a few series, a ton of uh, some spinoff series uh, that are sort of adjacent worlds. But yeah. uh, the, the core group of Radiolab, they don't really need me right now. Yeah. Um, I'm much more at like in a mentor trainer kind of role okay. uh, for that for that group. Um, and I just kind of hang out cause, with them because they're cool. I'd be remiss not to, to pick your brain a bit further about the Dolly Parton thing. Um, sure. Yeah. You know, how did how did that come about and what, what were your ambitions and you know goals for setting up something like like that that of that scale uh, and why dolly parton yeah that was a that was a that was a weird kind of bit of fate uh like okay. two two well let's see it happened in a few different ways at once which was um you know growing up in tennessee yeah dolly parton is she's like the patron saint like she yeah. is everywhere i mean she's literally on every billboard you know, where's Dolly World? Part Dolly Dolly World is is that in Tennessee or is it? It is in Tennessee. Okay. It's in Knox. It's like an hour outside of Knoxville. Okay, Dolly Wood, I should say. Sorry, Dolly. Um, yeah, yeah, but Dolly World. I think of Tennessee as Dolly World. Okay, I think of America at this point as Dolly World, Absolutely. and then Dolly Wood <laughs> is in Knoxville or outside of Knoxville. Okay, uh, right next to the the where she grew up. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, what what basically what happened is twenty uh, like twenty sixteen election. Um, the uh, the you know like if you, it's hard to even remember back this far, yeah. But like, uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump were campaigning, and it was just a dumpster fire, right? There was like the locker up chance. Mm-hmm. There was the whole deplorables thing. It was just like the the political discourse was in the toilet, mm-hmm. and that was what we were seeing on TV every day. And and through the middle of all of that, Dolly was on a sixty city tour or something. Wow! Like a stadium tour through the middle of the elections, and I remember she came to Queens, and uh, suddenly all of these like godless liberals around me were like, "Oh my God, Dolly Parton's coming to town!" And I was like, "You you like Dolly Parton?" Like I like stupidly, I thought, oh, I, I thought only people in Nashville like Dolly Parton. Mm-hmm. Uh, I and I was amazed that all of these New Yorkers were like so excited, like these like 20 year old women. Right. That I work with. And they all went to the show and then they all came back telling the same story, which is like Dolly Parton shows are trippy. Like 
there's like there's there's men in drag next to men in trucker hats you'll see confederate flags you'll see people in rainbow jackets it's just like every bit of america yeah, just yeah, yeah. smashed together and uh and i was like well oh, that's interesting like that space doesn't seem to exist anymore in, in america and in my mind i was thinking about the the election and mm-hmm, i was like mm-hmm. wow weird like that's an alternate america right there at a, at her shows so I, I got interested at that point i was like oh, how does she do that now this is the weird bit of fate like going back a bit um dolly parton in 2013 i think gets into a car crash minor gets taken to vanderbilt my dad ends up being the person the doctor who who uh became her doctor for a minute okay uh and after they were doctor patient they just got to be friends you know and they would see each other like every so often and she would even call him and they would talk okay i never actually believed that this was true i was like there's no (laughs) way you know dolly parton that's just not that's not reality (sighs) but then in 2016 when i started seeing people coming back from the show i was like dad do you really know dolly parton like, is that, is that actually real? And he's like, yeah. So I, can't, I flew to Nashville and I, I forced him to introduce me to her. Okay. And I was like, I want to do something about you. And, and she did it, I think, really more as a favor to him. Like, wow. she didn't know who I was and wow. didn't really. And she doesn't do, like, long interviews. Like, she does 20-minute interviews and then she's done. Yeah. But I, I interviewed her 12 times for, like, wow. hours and hours. Oh, my God. So, like, and it was all nepotism. Like, my dad... Like it would not have happened without my dad. Wow. So I'll be the first to admit that. But uh, yeah, you know, just as as those interviews kept going, I began to sort of think of Dolly as this way of seeing the South, mm-hmm. seeing Appalachia and seeing American history. Right. Like she has been in the public eye for 60 years. Crazy. You know, so she's seen and she traveled from a place with no electricity way up in the mountains and, and became like the queen of nashville which was like the south the southern la right yeah and so it was just amazing like her journey was amazing to me the 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 phases of her music became really interesting to me uh and it all just was really like trying to figure out how to a new way to see america in the middle of these culture wars you know she became a really interesting case study to me on so many levels so yeah it was a nine-part series and we just kept turning over i mean i made it with a i should say with a, a wonderful producer named shima oliai and she and i worked together on it and uh we just kept turning over new ways of thinking about dolly and so it was initially going to be a three episode thing and it just mm-hmm. kept ballooning wow um so yeah that's how it worked amazing that's how it happened. amazing thanks dad yeah yeah i say thanks dad on so many levels oh, that's totally. really cool man i feel like we could keep going forever I totally, this is really fun. I really appreciate you diving deep within yourself and within kind of the history of the show and letting, letting us hear how you put it together and and how it kind of works and doesn't work. And, um, I'm sure we're going to get so much more after watching this and, and coming back and talking with you, uh, you know, during the semester next year, but yeah, I would. And, and if you ever want to do this again, man, I'm, I'm, I'm game. This is really fun. Well, thank you, Jed. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Signing off. Thank you, sir. Okay.